Hello viewers and welcome to Europa Universalis 4. I'm your host Pew Pew Choo Choo and today we will be starting our Let's Play as Spain. Although uh, actually inside 1444 Spain is not present on the map. Instead we will be starting off as its predecessor also known as Castel which will then form Spain. So without further ado let us, uh, let us begin the game and let us start playing. Uh, some of you guys may remember me from our Let's Play of Crusader Kings 2 in which we took a look at uh, the faction of Leon, uh, which was present inside that game. Uh, well, we're back for round 2 now, and we're going right back to the Iberian Peninsula. And the reason we're doing that is because uh, Castel, later on Spain, gives us a really rather nice location to fully experience the game because it just has everything to offer, really. We can explore uh, every single part of the game from this little bit, and... And um, with that being said, right, uh, our nation is, well, is going to be just right in size, not too big, not too small. We can do whatever we like and uh, actually have the ability to do it while well, not being uh, hampered by having uh, too much micromanagement, making it really rather nice beginner start. And with that said, uh, well, we will be kind of slowing down the pace of this Let's Play a little bit and uh, really going from there. So. Starting off, let's take a look at uh, some of the possibilities for Spain and uh, we're rather Castel for now, <laughs> and uh, how we plan on proceeding inside this Let's Play. First and foremost, we've got to uh, take a look at our country in general, settle a few general things inside our country itself. Um, afterwards, we will most likely be pursuing a goal down here in North Africa and the Straits of Cabotrar. Um, so, a little background for Castel and, uh, you know, a little bit of world history. Um, during a large period of, uh, I, I believe, the 1200s and somewhere around there, um, Spain, where uh, Castel is his territory, and actually all of the, all of the uh, Castellans and essentially all of the uh, people uh, who are now inside Spain or inside the Iberian Peninsula, all were uh, essentially down inside this little strip of land right here. And that's because somewhere uh, down in the lines, uh, the Moors from North Africa were actually uh, able to come up through the uh, the coast and actually invade the country and claim the bottom half, or uh, more than the bottom half actually, about the uh, the bottom three quarters, th quarters of the place. And for the longest time now, the people from Castel, from Leon, and from uh, the little country country um, place over here uh, had decided were essentially banded up and went on a crusade of sorts a reconquest of their lands taking back their uh, native provinces down here including Madrid and some of these places like Badajoz and um, yeah really just pushing the Moors back to the coast and well it is the year 1444 and this is all that remains uh, what this game what uh, we want to do inside the early game phase here is essentially continuing off with the reconquest, take this place back and uh, you know drive the Moors um, into their home front, taking some of their lands as well actually as we go. Um, by the time that is accomplished, what we uh, plan on doing is that we're going to take a look at the colonial mechanics inside the game and advance into the Americas, either uh, north or south. Um, either way, we're definitely going to go there inside this playthrough. And, and once that is done, uh, there are a few historical events scheduled inside the game which will essentially bring us into conflict with France under the assumption that we go into Italy. Uh, because Spain did go into Italy and it actually did go into uh, northern Europe as well over here here. Um, if you remember from Empire Total War, I believe, Spain actually had quite a little bit of a presence inside Italy, and it also did have uh, a few people, uh, or rather a province, called Flanders up here. Um, so, that's all inside the future. Right now, uh, we need to take a look at a few domestic things before we get started with the game. Um, we just simply click on the crest here and it'll give us a list of or rather a tab system of different things that we can essentially just take a look at and right now we will be just kind of going through these um, so let's begin by going through the government tab we are a feudal monarchy which grants us two benefits or two buffs we gain a national manpower modifier which will help us in military terms and a um, income from vassals benefit which will help us in the economy portion although this one is a little bit more irrelevant seeing as how you do need to subjugate a nation in order to use this one and um, it really uh, that's not very likely happening inside our playthrough here uh, but what 
we do need to keep in mind is our king here, King Juan II, and uh, more importantly than his name is his stats. He has one administrative skill, one diplomatic skill, and two inside military skill. And what does all of this mean? Well, inside Europa Universalis 3, these stats were, I would say that they were fairly irrelevant in that it's nice to have a lot of them inside that game, but they weren't particularly crucial. However, that is definitely not the case in uh, EU4, seeing as how these uh, stats actually affect uh, our administrative power, our diplomatic power, and our military power here. Uh, they, these are essentially a conjunction of um, a few different things. And, well, these are actually what I would consider some of the most important resources inside the game. Uh, with that being said, we do need to uh, essentially try to keep these as high as we can. And I believe uh, these totals are a cumulative effect of our king, our advisors, and a base value derived from our country. Um, if we actually come over here to Aragon, uh, through the diplomacy panel, we can check out a few general information about some uh, nations using the top little bit here. Their king has 246, and in Portugal, Portugal's king has 322, so we are a little bit below average. Although, if we go into England over here, they actually have the worst king of all at uh, 000. So, we're definitely not last, but uh, we're definitely not first, right? Um, so, with that said, we would like to increase our, uh, our three powers here, and what we're going to do is that we are going to recruit a few advisors to help us out in that. So how these advisors, uh, advisors work is that we can essentially pay to uh, hire or ship in a, a noticeable person, um, pay a base price to ship him in, and then pay him a monthly fee uh, so then he can grant us uh, more in one particular skill as well as a particular modifier that he himself uh, has. We are going to get this artist along with us, and he will buff our administrative uh, power to 6, and uh, that will be very crucial later on, because these powers actually affect our technology, uh, our technology tree, and as with all strategy games, your tech tree is one of the most crucial parts of our game, and what we're essentially going to do is that we're going to come in here and we're essentially going to nab two more ministers. This time we're going to nab... Um, two level one plus one ministers simply because they are much cheaper to maintain at only one gold as opposed to four so we have it set up here so we have a bonus to uh where we have a stability cost modifier so that'll be rather helpful later on we have better relations over time um a safe bet really i just needed somebody who get to gave us plus one he seemed like a good choice and we have cristobal colon here for our military guy again i needed someone to fill the slot slot um, but he does give us a reinforced speed which will be helpful uh, as soon as we get into combat when our troops start taking damage um, your units essentially have uh, 1000 uh, men inside them at maximum capacity and when they take damage they typically heal either really fast if you're on your own term turf and really slow if you're on enemies' turf um, so that will be fairly important later on and uh, right now we do have one military leader I'll talk a little bit more about that later on but I'm just going to assign him to that army just in case I forget later on uh, we already talked about the diplomacy panel here a little bit. At the top, you essentially get the gist of a nation, what their king is like, what type of cultures they are, what type of technology group they are, and what their um, their tech tree levels are. Uh, but down here, we can see what our relations are with the known uh, factions inside the game. Um, we can choose rivals, essentially, uh, if we choose a rival. Um, it will make fighting our rivals easier and more rewarding, but we'll take a look at that later on. The main thing is that it keeps a list of who we have truces with, who we have uh, military treaties with, or uh, who we have wars against, and who we can go to war against using a cusus belli, which is uh, Latin for, I believe, like a, a right a right to war or something like that. I, I To be honest, I don't know the exact translation, um, but it does mean uh, essentially the a justification for war is, uh, is what I believe it means. So uh, moving forward, we have the economy tab. This is, uh, well, there's a few situational things here, such as raise war taxes and reduce inflation. Um, but the gist of this panel is that it is your account's uh, your account book. Um, the only one, the main thing that we had to keep track of is our budget and uh, how, what our balance is doing. And because we have quite a few expensive advisors right now, we're going to lower our maintenance for our army, seeing as how our army isn't fighting right now. So why are we, uh, are, why are we, you know, maintaining uh, DEFCON 1 really? We have a trade window here, which is uh, actually, um, 
earning us quite a little bit of cash right now at 2.2 uh, deniers. I'll talk a, a lot more about the trade window later on, simply because it really deserves like five minutes by itself. Uh, tech tree, we essentially spend those uh, different three powers into building our nation, and these are absolutely critical for advancing inside the game, and it's, it's obviously a very good thing if we were able to generate a lot of um, a, a lot of the three powers at once to advance inside these uh, trees. Um, actually, one of the main things, uh, one of the reasons that, that I had decided to hire a plus two advisor for our administrative power is actually for the purpose of research. Um, when you research into the administrative tech tree, uh, you can essentially unlock idea groups and then uh, ideas from there. And how ideas play out is that uh, ideas are essentially a perk system for a faction. Um, at level four, so when we uh, when we level up our administrative technology in uh, by one, we can essentially choose choose a list of uh, different uh, ideas to essentially um, embe embellish into our nation. I'm probably going to go with the exploration one, um, seeing as how these are the ones that will take us into the Americas. And how that works is that uh, we use administrative ideas to essentially unlock a little section of these ideas. So for example, exploration ideas again. And then from there, uh, because it's under the diplomatics, diplomatic ideas section, we'll spend diplomatic points in unlocking uh, each and every single one of these little icons, which represents a perk for our faction. And then as we do that, we will effectively gain um, some uh, pr uh, more progress onto this progress meter. And then as we do that, we'll unlock uh, faction specific uh, perks or ideas, essentially uh, things only meant uh, for Spain up here, which is rather nice. And actually, if we finish off one entire collection of these, uh, well, I like to I like to call them little tokens. We actually gain a, another perk once we can collect uh, essentially all of them, which is rather neat. Um, so yeah, that's kind of that. Moving forwards, we have the missions and decisions tab. Missions essentially guide your nation. You can assign yourself a few arbitrary missions. The game is a sandbox game, but uh, if you choose to do these missions, they'll definitely give you a, a pretty good reward, and it'll kind of guide you throughout the game. National decisions are things that'll effectively last till the end of the uh, to the end of the game in 18 in the uh, 1800s somewhere around there and they will essentially modify your nation and somehow uh, you can repeal a, for a few of them I believe um, right now what we're going to do is that uh, well we're going to accept the mission to form an alliance with Portugal simply because that's really easy and that is going to benefit us in the short term right here so we're going to do that I'll talk more about the stability panel and I guess the religion panel and a little actually I'll talk a little bit more about the three here uh, later on simply because they honestly they're more or less uh, situational I mean they come up religion and stability more or less aren't all too situational but I mean right now they aren't things that we had to worry about and I'd rather uh, keep things simple so, um, well, we're going to speed up the game here, and uh, what we're going to do is uh, we're going to come to Portugal. Because we have that mission uh, there, we're going to come over here, and that we are uh, we're going to offer them an alliance, pretty much, to complete that mission. Now, our alt our uh, our short term goal is to conquer the the little country of Gradana over here. Um, this is actually part of a mission to finish the Reconquista. Uh, re the Reconquista. Uh, we can essentially do this mission and finish off these guys for a nice tidy uh, reward. Um, but the only problem is that you may have noticed that inside uh, our diplomacy panel, these guys have actually came up. And this is because we have a truce with them until January 1st, 19, or 1448. So we are going to have to wait until then before we can use this uh, Casas Belli against them. Um, so with that said, inside the meantime, we will be uh, taking a look at the mission system because I, I think this is a really nice system and it does um, offer us a nice uh, recommended path throughout the game. Um, it looks like we have another mission here to form an alliance with uh, Navarra, so we're going to accept this one. Uh, as you can probably tell, you can only have one mission at a time and we're just going to send one of our diplomats, uh, our diplomats over there and we're going to form another alliance. 
uh, how your diplomacy and how your trade, how your colonialism and how your uh, religion works is that you spread it using your notable people of your court located up here. And these guys are your, uh, your, peop your, um, your will pretty much. So we have two diplomats here. Um, typically I keep one diplomat at home and then I use one outside doing uh, other stuff. Uh, so we're actually going to send one of our one of our um, diplomats to the Papal states. Uh, we're actually going to form an alliance with them because we can. And we are going to send another guy to just kind of improve our relations over time with them. And uh, well, that should keep us safe for uh, for a little bit because Aragon over here, they also have some ties to Italy, and these guys they don't like us very much, and we don't like them very much. I believe they've uh, they will, or rather they they may make us their rivals later on inside the game, as you can see here. Uh, our stats are inside the negative, both going uh, to them and from them. So they don't like us, we don't like them. That's fine, uh, but. We do need to conquer them in order to form Spain, so we will do that later on. Uh, right now, we have the alliance set up. What I think I'll do is that I'll accept uh, this mission to form a royal marriage with uh, Navarra. And seeing as how they already have a request over here, uh, we will just you know accept this. And that will accomplish that. So royal marriages are a political action that you can undertake. It will give you a relationship bonus and typically a alliance with the uh, the faction. Not you're not guaranteed in getting an alliance, but uh, typically due to the relationship buff, you you might get it. Um, the thing about that is, uh, well, if you do choose to form a lot of royal marriages, what will happen is that you may end up with a fairly uh, weak heir to the throne. You'll see here that uh, Enrique, our heir to the throne, he has a strong claim to the throne. Well, if he had a weak one, say if we had a lot of royal marriages, uh, potentially with like you know France or something, France might say, "Hey, well, he only has a he only has a weak claim to the throne, so he can actually come down here. France can actually come down here and essentially." conquer our lands in the event our king dies and he has somebody with a weak claim um, in that situation right so uh, you know it's always uh, good to keep that high um, so moving forwards uh, we have did that let's uh, let's do another one of these missions just to kind of pass the time here we are going to spread our culture into one of our provinces over here so, um, some parts of our country have not yet been uh, incorporated into our land fully. If we switch the map mode into uh, this map mode, you'll notice that uh, this uh, particular tile isn't inside uh, Castilian culture, and it is actually one of the not one of the accepted ones. So, what happens inside this province is that we're not earning as much tax as we can, we're not gaining as much manpower from it as we can, and the most important thing to me is that we're not gain we uh, we're suffering a bit of a revolt risk, which means that uh, rebels may come out of that province. So, what we're going to do is that we're going to accept this mission. Uh, and then essentially use the demographics here to convert that province into our uh, culture using some of our diplomatic power here. But that's all right because um, we don't necessarily need all too much diplomatic power right now. And well, we will just be doing that. Looks like uh, we have a call from arms. So one of our allies wants us to join up into a war against, uh, from the looks of it, Aragon. Um, we are actually going to uh, decline this simply because we don't want to fight just yet um, and um, well this will essentially avoid our alliance with them but they were a fairly small nation uh, so it's not really that big of a deal uh, what we want to do right now is that we do want to complete a lot of these missions and essentially just farm them up because generally speaking I mean they do get uh, they do give a good benefit f to us for uh, for completing them so we have one guy doing that, and we can uh, we can send another person somewhere. I think I'll get one of our um, one of our diplomats to permanently just kind of reside inside Savoy for now. Uh, we're not permanently, but we want some, him to just kind of stay there, boost our relations with there, because I want to get a few of alliances going on, something to uh, just kind of protect us inside the early game, and I guess we'll form an alliance with them too. 
so that's kind of that. Um, one of the things that your uh, your diplomats can actually function as is that uh, spies have been removed from the game. Um, in Europa Universalis 3s, you would uh, you would have five different types of uh, people at your court instead of these four. You would have to spy, and he would essentially do all of these covert actions. But now it has been changed so that your uh, your diplomats essentially do them. Um, so yeah, they also function as that. They can support rebels. Do all, all of these are fairly self-explanatory. Fabricate claim is just fabricating a casus belli against a faction. So even though you don't have any like you know technically legitimate terms against a faction, you can use that to go uh, to war with them. And for now, it is the quiet time where we speed up ahead. In this time, what I will be doing is that I want to build a few things for our uh, nation. One of the things that we want to do is that we want to build a few Latin Knights uh, to bolster our military. And we're going to build four of those, simply because that's the, uh, the maximum that we can. And we're going to get our fleet over here to actually sail to the Straits of Gabatra. And uh, the reason that we want to do that is because we want to start making more money. And how we want to do that is that we want to influence the trade uh, inside particular places. So for example, if we put our fleet here, um, you'll see that our trade power, the 51.7 there, was increased from the 3,000 something, or sorry, the 30 something. And that's because, uh, well, now that we have our fleet here with a few trade ships, it'll increase our, our trade power inside that trade hub. And, uh, well, we're going to look at the uh, trade system just briefly right now. Uh, but before we do, we do that, it looks like two events popped up. Well, one is a random event, one is uh, something directly related to the game. It looks like we've been informed by the commander of the guard that Aragon has been trying to fabricate a claim, so they've been trying to fabricate a Cusus Belli in one of our provinces. Um, because we have a fairly decent uh, level inside the... inside the... Uh, what's it called? spy defense we were able to just kind of be alerted to that and then uh we weren't able to stop them but we were able to severely hinder his process his progress um and in the meantime a random event happened these random events essentially represent the uh, the minor events that happen throughout your your uh, your reign um of your of your government really so uh it looks like some sh a visit from shady people uh, a few slightly shady characters have appeared at one of our courts and offered their services to the king. They claim to be willing and able to do things that any proper ruler would never uh, dision to do publicly. So these shady people are able to increase our spy offensive for about five years. Um, but chances are is that we won't be doing any offensive actions on like uh, Aragon over here. So we will actually refuse their offer. Um, in exchange for a little bit of prestige. So as you saw there, I mean, I can highlight over the two different choices. You'll typically be presented with two. You might have an odd case where you're presented with three or more, although um, I think that that those ones are more likely, or those, those ones are more frequent inside uh, some of the other Paradox interactive games, like uh, Hearts of Iron 3. So uh, that is all done and said. Right now, we are just kind of waiting for uh, some stuff. Uh, some more random events happen. It looks like a revolt is uh, is going on. This one may have been influenced by uh, some of the problems inside our nation, such as the uh, the different cultures present um, and stuff like that. But some of these may be a little more on the random side. So a, ra uh, a revolt happened. We can either suppress the rebels by uh, going into fight to go and fight them, or alternatively, we can negotiate with them. Um, it actually so happened to uh, say that these rebels actually are located inside the province that we were trying to convert into our uh, our culture. So if this province was uh, our culture, this revolt might have not happened. Well, seeing as how we're halfway in the middle of converting them, I'm just going to uh, negotiate with them. Um, simply because as soon as their province is converted, those, uh, benef those uh, modifiers will be changed again. Um, looks like we are actually running out of money, so we do need to, uh, well, that's why we didn't uh, lower the maintenance bars low enough. Um, so it looks like we did take out a loan, that's fine and all, because we can repay it in a little bit uh, when we have the money, so that's alright, that's a mistake that we can correct uh, fairly easily. 
And that's simply because we're paying uh, quite a bit of a premium hiring that uh, that guy, keeping our administrative power high. But it will be very, very useful keeping that administrative power high. So we do want to uh, kind of continue his services. And right now, uh, we will repay the loan whenever we can. There we go. And a royal uh, marriage from Savoy has uh, come over here, so that is good. Well, uh, let us accept this offer. And perfect, that should, uh, that should complete some things over there. In the meantime, since we have our fleet patrolling uh, one of our trade hubs, let's take a look at what type of benefit that actually, uh, or what type of profit that brings us. So going to our trade window over here, we gain and we gain more trade power inside our trade hub. And I believe how the trade system works here is that because we're going to uh, we're going to use the system all throughout the game, we might as well uh, get it over with now. Um, to my understanding, this trade network is uh, well, it's fairly complex as you can see. Uh, my general gist of it is that it works like a railroad. How it essentially goes is that, for example, if we come over here, you'll see that lines of trade routes are being uh, spread across the map. And how this works is that trade goods come from uh, provinces neighboring this route. Each province provides tax income, um, but also trade income located here from producing a trade good uh, in this bottom panel. So what essentially happens is that some of the money from producing these trade goods stay inside the province or stay inside the nearby trade hub and then whoever is the local uh, merchant uh, owner there or the majority holder of the merchants there will be able to generate a lot of profit by taking some of those trade routes out of the, the circulation out of the web and then converting it into money. However, the vast majority of the stuff will essentially go down this web. And for example, if Cairo over here produced maybe say 10 units of spices, maybe five would be sold in Alexandria generating um, generating the Mamluks uh, money. And then the rest of that would go into say Venice. Uh, maybe, I don't know, three units would be sold, and then it'll move over here to um, Genoa or something like that, and then uh, maybe another unit would be sold, and then it'll finally move down here to our uh, our trade hub of Sevilla, and then maybe, uh, you know, we'll gain one point from there. So yeah, that's kind of how this system works, and it looks like not very much uh, trade actually leaves this place. We actually, uh, I believe we actually take a pretty large share out of uh, this place. Yeah, we have 27% trade power here. Uh, Portugal, Portugal is in our lead here at 69 uh, trade power. And how we can increase trade power is that uh, we can do a wide variety of things such as increase our, uh, our realm's stability, uh, adopt trade, um, trade uh, ideas inside the ideas tab here or we can actually go into the government tab here and hire a advisor that gives us a global trading power benefit or alternatively we can uh, actually build up a larger trading fleet of these uh, barak um, bark bark ships um, which will be able to uh, increase our trading power by three each yeah so that's uh, that's kind of how that works now in the meantime we uh, we will just essentially continue on here and really just go along with the flow hmm it is now November 1447 so we're fairly getting fairly close to a date in which we can uh, you know kind of start off our uh, military conquest and now that it is January we are able to so I'll pause the game here and I think I'll actually end the video here now that we've gotten set up next time we will take a look at conquest so be sure to you to join me for that uh, be sure to like and subscribe as always for those uh, automated notifications when videos come out I'll see you guys next time where we take a look at combat take uh finish the reconquista and uh maybe even move into north africa so i'll see you guys then uh till then bye bye